put an end to this topic once and for all, turn the Hubble round and show us um, Earth in real time, zooming in onto a, a place so that we can see what's happening at that place and, and we know that there is something up there looking down on us um, um, from space. But they will not do it. They can't do it. It, 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 can't, it doesn't exist. It literally doesn't exist. It's, it's all fraud. It's all fake. Um, pretty much everything NASA puts out is, is fraudulent. Um, nobody has actually um, really gone all the way across Antarctica. Yeah. Now there are millionaires out there who who could you know assemble the resources to make an expedition and completely you know go across and chart Antarctica and make a name for themselves, being the first person to do that. Yeah. But nobody ever does. Um, now you can actually measure the temperature of the moonlight next to the, measure, the temperature of the uh, shade of the moonlight and you'll find the moonlight is colder than the shade, the opposite from the sun. So the moon is throwing out its own light and that light is the opposite from the sun. Now that tells you that it's not reflecting the sun's light. Uh -huh. It's producing its own and its light is different from the sun's. So, you know, the scientific community have not told us this, yeah, because they won't tell us this because um, it destroys this idea that the, the sun is, you know, is lighting up the moon. The other thing that's uh, about the spinning Earth is looking at the stars. Now, um, directly above the axis of spin is the pole star, Polaris, okay, um, directly over the North Pole. And um, we're told that the reason that all the stars spin around the, uh, the, the North Star is because the, the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour. Okay? Seems to make sense because if you put a long exposure camera uh, pointing at the North Star, you'll see um, the stars will make perfect circles around, perfect star trails. The only problem is the, um, the Earth is also orbiting the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. Okay? The sun is moving, dragging the earth and all the, all the planets up that way or that way um, at 600,000 miles an hour. So why do we see perfect circles? You know, because that's the slowest speed, <laughs> that's um, uh, slowest motion in that, in that mix. And, and yet the, the Earth is moving 67 times faster that way and 600 times faster that way. So you should see the stars do all sorts of strange mo um, motions, but you don't. You only see them make these perfect circles. That tells me that it's the stars that are moving, not the Earth. And if a pilot is, uh, is flying around the curve of the Earth, then it sh he should be dipping the nose down um, every, every five minutes you should be dipping the nose down to, to stay around the curve. But the thing that really um, uh, got me interested was, as you say, the gyroscope. In, in a plane there is a, um, an artificial horizon, okay, and it's based on a gyroscope. And if you spin a gyroscope um, on a surface, it will want to stay upright. You can twist and tilt the surface as much as you like, the gyroscope will stay upright. So, if a plane has a gyroscope and it starts um, following the curve of the Earth, mm. the gyroscope would stay upright, which mm. means your, the uh, 
um, artificial horizon will start to, to roll backwards. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. Mm -hmm. That's absolute proof that a plane flies over a flat surface rather than a curved one. Because um, I asked the pilot um, on my last flight, um, you know, does, do you ever notice the, the, auto, um, the artificial horizon uh, rolling backwards? He said, no, no, but the artificial horizon has complex electronics in it to, to make sure it knows where it is on the earth and it compensates. But I went to um, the manufacturer of the artificial horizon and they confirmed to me that it's completely mechanical, nothing electronic in it at whatsoever. So it's, it's literally just a gyroscope that can freely move. So that right there is proof to me that um, you know, planes fly over a plane. The, the problem is that we're taught as children um, you know, uh, this, this ball earth lie. And um, you, know, you might ask as a child, you know, um, what about the people in Australia? You know, they're standing on the bottom of the globe, won't they fall off? And your teacher says, no, no, gravity. And you go, oh, OK. And you never, never go back to that question. But when you go back to it as an adult and start looking at it with a critical eye, right, the whole thing falls apart. As you say, the, the globe is, is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's um, a leading astronomer in America, tells us that, that the Earth is not a perfect circle. It is actually an oblate spheroid. It's squashed mm -hmm. and, uh, and wider at the equator. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So... Um, znači, po, po stesnet je na polovite, a po širok je na ekvatorot. Exactly. Um, so my question to him would be, why is there land at the equator? Because um, water will move more readily than rock. So if the earth is spinning, the water will be um, collected at the equator. I mean, if you spin a wet um, tennis ball, okay, you spin a wet tennis ball, the water shoots off mm -hmm at the equator, essentially. So all the water will be g um, gathered around the equator. So why is there land at the equator? Doesn't make any sense. The, it seems like Admiral Byrd found the edge of the dome, mm -hmm. okay, um, while he was out there. And as soon as he left there, they started firing missiles straight up, I believe, to try and test how far that, that dome went. If you watch the trajectory of the space shuttle, it doesn't go straight up, it always goes in a curve um, and out to sea, yeah? And if you see it... Why is that? Well, because it... That, is it normal to go straight up? Well, as fast as he can to go out of the, of well, the atmosphere? Um, I, you know, I, again, I'm, I've been talking to a few people um, in, in sort of the scientific community and they'll say, no, straight up isn't the right way to go. You have to sort of go sort of around the curve and, and, and get speed to, to get into orbit. But still, the point is that they, they actually go horizontal. The space shuttle goes horizontal. It never goes any further up. It goes horizontal, um, very, very low down in the, in the atmosphere. Um, because it lets it drops its um, external tank um, while it's still in the atmosphere, um, so you know it's it's still in the atmosphere while it's uh, horizontal. So it never gets any higher, and it goes out of sight. Not because it goes too high, because it goes too far downrange. Um, and it seems that uh, nobody's ever on the space shuttle, and the proof of that is the Challenger disaster. Um, in, uh, I believe it's 1986, the Challenger exploded just after takeoff and killed seven astronauts. But it turns out that six of the astronauts are still alive and uh, most of them are using their original names. Um, and you, you, know, uh, you can find pictures of them, they're, they're using the same names and they're, they're doing ordinary jobs now. Teachers. Teachers, lecturers, um, lawyers, whatever. But, um, but they're still alive. And, um, and you can see, whenever the space shuttle la lands, um, you can hear it, it's, it's a loud jet engine. Um, you watch any, any video of uh, the space shuttle landing, it, you can tell it's a jet engine. Uh, that's a, it's a jet-powered aircraft. That's it, it's not a glider. Um, in my video, I show you a glider, 
how that seems and then I'll show you the, the space shuttle and yeah it's not a glider it's it's an aircraft um, and that's what they're fooling us uh, taking billions of dollars in and giving us images and uh, and, and fake planes um, for that 10 billion you know how ma however many billions of dollars it is that isn't the first thing that's been hidden over the years I mean we're all driving petrol cars because because a hundred years ago the Rockefeller family uh, basically cornered the market on oil and the, um, the car industry was going electric. So, you know, all cars would have been electric from, from the get-go, but they basically forced um, everybody to use um, petrol cars and have hidden this secret. And, and literally, you know, we could be running around in electric cars that, that have um, unlimited mileage by now. But, uh, but we're still using these, these 100 year old um, machines, dirty machines, because of a, a secret that's been, been kept. It's, it's, it's easy. If everybody's been trained into believing that this is real, right, um, and, uh, and there's space, and uh, it's, it's uh, within our interest to, to explore space and uh, you well, know, go to the moon, go to Mars. We've been led yeah. to believe what a satellite is, is something that is so far advanced and technically incredible that it's floating around up there on its own. We see these on videos, we see this on television. Oh, look at this satellite. It's always a CGI photo or video or some sort of artist rendition of what the satellite looks like. It's the drawing. Every single video we've all ever seen, they're all CGI videos and images of satellites. They never show you something in real time. Why can't they show it in real time? Because it's not where they say it is. But what is up there is a real satellite, but it's not at the altitude they claim it is. It is giving off a frequency and signature. It is floating in the sky, but not unaided. You only see it at night, and when you see it, it's, it's the moonlight or the sunlight reflecting off of this. Now I know why these, why these satellites have to have these gold and, and aluminum reflective surfaces because they are maintaining the lie, fraud, illusion. Oh, look at the satellite up in the sky. You see the sun reflect off of it? There it is. But you don't see the tether. You don't see this dark colored black balloon floating in the nighttime sky. So here's what the guy says. About how many balloons would you be looking for at one time? Mitchell says the number would depend on the balloons identified in a daily mission. Frag order, fragmentary operations order. Their codes would be listed. So each one of these balloons has a frequency and a code. This guy's saying, I think it was 10,000 feet the beacons would, would continue to function. We, can, we thought that, that they went down and were in the snow in the Brooks Range or, or some of the other mountains up in Alaska. He says, did your unit tell, the, tell you the purpose or the mission of the genetics while you were doing this? He says, yeah, we knew. The balloons were launched from Norway Look at this, people. The balloons were launched from Norway, Denmark, West Germany, and I think some from Turkey. In the winter, February of 1956, there was an article in Time magazine about the Russians complaining about our overflight of the Soviet Union with these balloons. Holy shit, people. I mean, really. The Russians were complaining about the U.S. flying over the Soviet Union with balloons. The Russians would complain about overflights of, of the Soviet Union with balloons. They had any number of gondolas stacked in the Sperodonska Palace driveway of foreign ministry. Molotov. It was just unbelievable. He had many of them. What they're describing here is this. The Soviets ended up capturing a shitload of these fucking balloons the U.S. was sending up in the air. And they would literally send their aircraft up to capture them and bring them down. Now, you got to think about this, people. <laughs> this is absolutely mind-blowing. You're trying to tell me that we've been spending trillions of dollars for over 60 years for a satellite program they claim is going up on a rocket, and it's just a balloon you can buy from a hobby shop? Oh, my God. This is incredible. An interesting fact, the airplane I flew during the corona program had many recoveries of balloons than any airplane in the 456 wing. 
It was flown by Captain Slaughter Mims. And I think Slaughter recovered three balloons near Japan. He got more than anyone else. Slaughter had a lot of success. And he's describing the same aircraft that this guy flew. Okay? Here you go. This guy, Macaulay says, how, sex, how successful was the Genetrix program? Mitchell says, none of the pilots associated with the project was ever permitted to see any of the genetic film that was recovered. The film was stored in the vaults at Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base, the last I heard. I was at Air University Film Library in 1957, and I asked if I could see the film, but they wouldn't let me because I didn't have need to know about it. Outwardly, I understood that, this, that it was a fair success. We knew more about the Russians than we would have without genetics. It wasn't, but it wasn't good enough to continue with in the conjunction with the U-2. It was like the U-2 wasn't as good as Discoverer. I have a document and a study on genetics done by a gentleman up in Minnesota. It gives the number that was recovered. A lot of the gondolas went into the water and were never recovered. They had a saltwater plug in them that dissolved when the plug came in contact with the water and eventually sank the gondola. That's what they say. That's what they say. Now, get this. Macaulay says, did the public ever see the Genetrix gondolas and, and think they were UFOs? Mitchell says, I never heard of any reports of that nature, if there were any. There could be, there could have been, I don't know. You know, it's been so long since that operation, I don't recall any newspapers that might have said that they were UFOs. I know you could see the balloon. Listen to what he says. He says, I know you could, you could see the balloon very easily from the ground. It looked, here you go, people, smoke and gun. It looked about like a silver dollar during the daytime because you couldn't see anything attached to it. You see this for yourself, people. He said it looked, you could see it from the ground and it looked like a silver dollar during the daytime because you couldn't see anything attached to it. So for all those naysayers out there that claim they've seen the Hubble, they've seen the ISS, they've seen other satellites and shit floating around in the sky. Think about this. That reflection that you see with the sun reflecting off of the aluminum surface or whatever type of aluminum, whatever type of shiny reflective material they're using for these satellites, carried by the jet stream flying around a specific territory that is tasked to fly around in. Macaulay says, at that time, did you normally call the program Dragnet or Genetrix? Mitchell says, we called it Dragnet. Genetrix was a classified code name for the program like Corona and Discoverer. Dr. Alvin H. Howell was the brains behind the balloon program. There you go. They lost one of these, okay? They lost one of the Corona satellites on a balloon, okay? This is a letter written to the Deputy Director for Science and Technology at the National Reconnaissance Office, okay? This was released, declassified and released by the National Reconnaissance Office November 26 of 1997 in accordance with executive order, I think that's 12958. Subject, Corona Mission 1005 Incident. This memorandum is for, the, for information only. Corona Mission 1005 was launched on 27 April into orbit. Orbit? It was, they're considering orbit to be space. We know it ain't fucking space, all right? But that's moved. Let's continue on. Recovery attempts commencing to May were unsuccessful. Attached here to is a chronology of operational reporting received on this mission. Number three, on August 5th, OSA received word from its security representative at the Air Force Base, Los Angeles, that a satellite capsule had been reported as coming down near the venezuelan colombia border. The actions taken by OSA upon receipt of this information are detailed in a separate attachment. As a result of the investigation by the OSA in conjunction with the Caracas station and the embassy attache office there, the following facts are noted. Listen to this, August 1st. First word was received by Caracas Army attache office a finding of a capsule at La Fria, 500 miles southwest of Caracas 
and a remote region of the Andes. August 3rd, reconfirmation of capsule finding made by telephone call to Caracas Embassy. August 4th, representatives of the embassy viewed capsule at San Cristobal to which it had been moved by political police. First press stories appeared. August 5th, capsule flown by host government to Caracas. August 6th to the 10th, capsule held by Minister of Defense of Venezuela. All right, August 8th, team from headquarters arrived at Caracas consisting of a security officer and a technical officer from the OSA office and a technical officer from the National Reconnaissance Office. August 10th, capsule turned over to embassy, examined and reports made by the headquarters team. Copies of pertinent cables on technical and security aspects attached. August 12th, security officer scheduled to return capsule to West Coast. August 6th to the 12th, for the record, it should be noted that on Thursday, 6th August, a request was made by the CIA to the NRO to convene a meeting of the Interdepartmental Contingency Planning Committee to assess the problems, coordinate procedures, and assign responsibility for responding to any news media queries which might arise. Now, what's interesting about this, they noticed there was a label that, that, that there was a, a secret um, label on in satellite. It was marked secret. They removed that classification from it. This is regarding the history of satellite reconnaissance, volume 2A, Samos. Remember that name, Samos, okay? The Samos satellite, because here's what I'm going to take you to next. This is the list of all balloon launches from the Isranj Space Center in Sweden. Okay? Now, let me take you let me take you to the Swedish Space Center. And here is the Swedish Space Center website. This is the Swedish Space Center. And as you can see, they have balloons and rockets, payloads. This is their website. This is their website. Swedish the Swedes, okay? It's the Swedes. Here's their space center. They do balloon launches. Now, let me take you the document I downloaded from their website. Now, this is a list of balloon launches from the Astron Space Center starting December 9th of 1982. Remember that term, Samos? You can read these documents for yourselves. We don't need to keep going through all this stuff together. I put a lot of this shit out for you people so that you can see this. You see they talk about weather satellite program, mapping satellite program, realignment controversy, new directions in satellite reconnaissance, okay? But let me take you to this document, which is very important from the Swedes. This is not U.S. oriented. I got this from a foreign country, okay? So you look at some of the launches. These, these are balloon launches, people. These ain't rockets. It says it, list of balloon launches. There's going to be some things here that you may see that are going to catch your eye, all right? Because I want you to look. You see the campaign, you look at the payload, all right? You got campaigns and payloads. And we're not going to go through all these codes, but you're going to see something that's going to catch your attention, all right? We're going to keep going through this, all right? Keep going through it. You're going to see something that's going to catch your attention, that's going to blow your mind. You see this, people? What does that say? Mir. That's the Mir space module, February 24th, 1997. Here goes another one. Mir. March 17th, 1997. Mir. Okay? I want you to see these things. All right, I want you to see these things. Let me take you to another one here, because there's a, let me, um, hang on. Let me see, here we go. Two more, Mir, February 18th, February 19th, 1999, Mir. It's the Mir space module, people, on a balloon. The ISS does not exist complete the way they show it on television. Here goes another one. Mir on a balloon. What they are showing you of the space station 
is a computer generated image. They are not showing you the complete module put together flying at 17,000 miles an hour. Here you go. Look at this support mirror. They sent up a support balloon to sub resupply the mirror on a balloon. On a balloon, people, look at this Orion. Orion payload. Look at here. In Marsat, you want to know where your satellite uh, phone communications come from? A balloon, people. A balloon. I'll supply this document to whoever wants it. Here we go. In Marsat test, balloon. If you were to take time to search every single one of these flights to match it up with a particular rocket launch that they claim this thing was on, I guarantee you, you will be able to compare it with this Swedish Isran Space Center balloon flight list. Balloon flight list. Balloons, people. That's your program. It's always been your problem. Look at this. Mirror short duration. Mirror VLD. Me, you got two VLD. Look at here. More mirror. This is in 2002, people. 2002. Every, for those in Europe, you ever heard of Inviasat? Look at Inviasat. Inviasat. These things are supposed to be testing the atmosphere for particulates and, you know, for pollution control. Balloons, people. You, you, you just, you can't come to any other conclusion. You don't have any other information to prove you were at the launch pad and you saw them put this thing inside the nose cone of a rocket. You didn't see it. You can work for NASA, you can work for the Germans, you can work for the Russians. You did not see what you thought you saw going into a nose cone of a capsule and with with a with an unedited video stream and put on a launch pad and launched into the sky on a rocket. You didn't see that. Look at NASA. Why is NASA using why is NASA using the Swedish to launch a balloon for them? Think about that. They're everywhere, people. They're carrying out the deception, the fraud, the hoax, the scam, the bullshit. It's all here. It's all here, people. I keep saying it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. You can talk about it all day long. You can claim this is your theory, this is your hypothesis. You ain't got no documentation to, to fucking back it up. You just want to show some bullshit video and you're not a videographer and you don't know how to do video analysis. You got to get the documentation. And here's the documentation right here. NASA, 2011, LED, ESO, high wind. Just check these out. Because I have NASA. 2003, 2013, Sunrise 2. Look at that. Balloon. Balloon, people. That's a complete list. It goes all the way to 2014. 2014, people. 2014. There you have it. There you have it, people. I don't know what else to tell you. I really don't know what else to tell you. Check this out. Just check this shit out. Check this shit out. Another satellite being launched from Antarctica. Check this out. You're going to love this one. That's Antarctica, people. Remember how we saw that circular launch pad? The bulldozer is smoothing out the, the ice and snow. Look at this. Just wait and see. Watch this. This is McMurdo Station in the background. McMurdo is right back here. They have line of sight to this airstrip.
Just look at this. This is your billion, trillion dollar fucking satellite program. A goddamn fucking balloon. A balloon, people. It goes fucking 20, 30 million dollars on a balloon. It's not inside a fucking rocket nose cone. There you go. <laughs> Woohoo! Woohoo! Yay! Hey. Now you want to know what NASA is spending all that fucking money for on helium? NASA has spent a shitload of money on helium. So you got to ask yourself. What the fuck is all that helium for, right? You think, okay, maybe it's for the vacuum chamber. They're doing all kinds of testing. No, bullshit. That fucking helium is so, it's for their fucking balloon program. What else would you use fucking helium for? What would you use helium for? You use fucking helium to fucking float. It's at 18,000 feet right now. Come on, people. This, this, this common sense. This common fucking logic. Hey, the payload is now at a hundred and five thousand feet. Look at that, hundred and five thousand feet. Quite well, even with the naked eye, it's nice and well inflated now. So, based on the size of that balloon, now well, we're at about one hundred twenty thousand feet. Look at that. So these things got to get to at least 150, maybe 100, maybe maybe they can get to about 180,000 feet. But at nighttime, see this fucking thing. You're not going to see it. You're not going to see the satellite, period. So we're going to go to aircraft. So let's go to the U2 Dragon Lady. Let's go to the U2 product card. Okay, so here's your U2. I can tell you here right now, this is a new upgrade in addition. They've upgraded the satellite system. So instead of, they're still using balloons, okay? They're still using balloons. But as far as military, advanced communications, topography, mapping, this platform, 33 of these are stationed around the world. 33 of them. Half of them are flown unmanned. Half of these can be flown without pilots inside of them. They can fly 24 hours. They can be refueled in the air at high altitude. They've, they've got everything on board that you would need to do the same communications on the ground. 15 of these can be flown without pilots, unmanned. When I spoke to my professor, who used to be a defense intelligence agency officer. He was in charge of the U-2 ISR program, Intelligence Surveillance and Crimes program. I asked him how many of these would be needed to cover the entire earth in a 24 hour period. He told me, you only need 10. In this video, there's a minimum of 75 Bible verses with prophecies and Bible codes that prove a flat geostationary earth. I've grouped most of these verses into groups of three, so I'm going to be counting down from 25 to 1. It'll make sense to you in a minute. Uh, and I've saved the best two for last. So let's start with some easy ones. Number 25, Corners. 
Isaiah 11, verse 12, four corners of the earth. Revelation 7, verse 1, four corners of the earth. Revelation 20, verse 8, the four corners of the earth. You can't have corners on a sphere. That's because the earth is not a sphere. It's flat. Number 24, still earth. Uh, 1 Chronicles 16, verse 30, The world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Psalm 96, verse 10, The world also shall be established, that it shall not be moved. Psalm 93, verse 1, The world also is established, that it cannot be moved. It's all consistent, clear as day. If the world isn't moving, then it's not spinning, and neither is it orbiting around the sun. Number 23, pillars. 1 Samuel 2, verse 8, For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. Job 9, verse 6, And the pillars thereof tremble. Psalm 75, verse 3, I bear up the pillars of it. There's nothing about a ball-shaped earth that you can fit pillars into. That's because the earth is not round, the pillars hold up a flat earth, there's a dome on top, the earth is flat. Number 22, the firmament dome. Isaiah 24, verse 18, For the windows of heaven are opened. It's a dome over a flat earth. Isaiah 13, verse 13, Therefore I will make the heavens tremble. If the heavens can tremble, then it has to have solidity to it. Genesis 1 verse 6, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. It's a dome over a flat earth that separates the waters above the dome. I read this so many times and I didn't see what was going on. I read the word firmament, didn't understand it, but it makes so much sense now when you take it literally. Strong's Concordance defines the word firmament as a solid expanse, roughly like the domed roof on this building here. Here's the inside of that dome, and the stars that we see in the sky would be fixed into this solid firmament. And the whole thing rotates around a flat, stationary Earth. That's why all the stars move around the sky together as one set piece. Because you can only have a solid dome separating the waters above from the waters and seas below on a flat Earth with the atmosphere in the middle. It doesn't work on a ball-shaped Earth. Number 21, the firmament dome continued. Isaiah 44, verse 24, I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. Well, you can't spread something out by rolling it into a ball. Uh, Psalms 18, verse 9, He bowed the heavens also. Uh, 2 Samuel 22, verse 10, repeats Psalms. It says, He bowed the heavens also. Strong's number H5186 describes the word bowed as bend. The heavens bend around us. It's a domed heaven around a flat earth. Number 20, the sun. There are 67 Bible verses that reference the sun moving. You can easily look this up. Uh, here's a title on one website that lists them all. But zero, zilch, nothing, no Bible verses at all that ever make reference to the earth moving. So, at the very least, the Bible supports a geostationary earth. Number 19, Bible codes. If you're familiar with Bible codes, then you'll know there's a matrix of flat earth clusters from Luke 13, verse 28 to Luke 14. Here's the matrix. Here's flat, earth, and an equidistant letter spacing. You'll also find dome, canopy, tent, truth, edge, disc, even, and a lot more. If you don't have Bible Code software, then you can do this for free at BibleCodeWisdom.com. Number 18, height and depth. Job 11, verse 8. It is as high as heaven. What can you do? Deeper than hell. What can you know? So, there's a height to heaven and a depth to hell. You can't have a height to heaven on a heliocentric, ever-expanding universe model. You can only have a height to heaven on a flat earth that has a dome over the top of it. Number 17, length and width. Job 11, verse 9. The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. It doesn't say 
longer than the sphere and broader than the curved ocean, you can't have a length and breadth on a ball unless you change the wording of the Bible to accommodate it. You can only have a length and breadth on a flat level plane. Number 16. Wisdom. Colossians 2 verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world. 1 Timothy 6 verse 20, false science. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. A ball-shaped world is wisdom to those that live in the world and get their information from TV or the education system. Uh, wisdom of a global earth is literally foolishness with God. True wisdom is not taught in the education system and neither will you find it on the six o'clock news. True wisdom is only found by carefully weighing up the options and that's what we've been doing on this channel for the last few months, weighing up the evidence. Really try to understand what the Bible is saying here in these three verses because it's telling us that the earth is flat, it's not round. Number 15, day and night. Job 26 verse 10, he has compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. Well, that's interesting. Here's a flat earth map. The outer bounds are made of ice. The waters are literally compassed with an ice boundary. The sun goes around the earth like this. Both day and night can only come to an end where day and night meet the dome. Beyond the dome, time ceases to exist. Whoever happens to live in that realm outside the dimension of time, beyond the dome, uh, which is the heaven, is also immortal. He's always been there. He can see the beginning and the end. Prophecies in the Bible inspired by the Holy Spirit show us the future is already foretold. And when the Bible talks of the everlasting, that's the place we all go to at some point. Problem is... Most of us who reject the truth will face everlasting shame. Like it or not, we're all going to meet our maker someday. So day and night can't possibly come to an end on a ball earth model. That's because the earth isn't a ball, the earth is flat. Number 14, Foundations. Job 38 verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. As we've just seen, the foundations of the earth are pillars. Isaiah 48 verse 13, my hand also has laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand has spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. If the heavens stand up at his command, then it's telling us here that the heavens are a dome. It's a solid dome. The earth is flat. Number 13, footstool. Isaiah 66 verse 1, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Matthew 5 verse 35, he's swearing, nor by earth, for it is his footstool. Act 7 verse 49, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. This is what a footstool looks like. It's got four pillars. Here's another one. How exactly are you mistaking this for this? What footstool spins at a thousand miles an hour? Number 12, desktop globe. Exodus 20 verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Isaiah 42 verse 8, Neither my praise to graven images. It's also the second of the Ten Commandments. So that rules out having a spinning globe on your desktop because what's a spinning globe? It's a graven image that depicts the earth. Why was the commandment not to have those things? Because it indoctrinates without even speaking. The earth isn't a globe, it's flat. Number 11, the stars. Matthew 24, verse 29. The stars shall fall from heaven. Mark 13, verse 25. And the stars of heaven shall fall. Revelation 6, verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. We've all been brainwashed into thinking the stars are massive and trillions of miles away. The Bible is telling us the stars are not massive, they're small, close, and they're going to fall to the earth. So the universe that we see up there is dome-shaped and small enough to contain all the stars that circle around 
the flat stationary Earth. Number 10. The Universe This is the ancient Hebrew view of the Universe. We've got the Earth on pillars, Sheol down there, and a dome over the flat geostationary Earth, and all the stars and the sun and the moon inside the dome going around the Earth. That's why in Genesis 1 verse 14 it says, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven, not orbiting a Milky Way galaxy. No, inside the dome, the firmament. Number 9. Sun Circuit Psalm 96 verse 10 The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. King James Version. Equally, that verse could support a ball-shaped earth, but it eliminates the possibility of the earth going around the sun. Bear that in mind for a moment. Psalm 19 verse 6, talking about the sun. His going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit until the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. If the sun has a circuit, then the sun is not the centre of the solar system, as we've been told. Critics will say, ah, yes, but the sun is on a circuit. It circles the centre of our Milky Way galaxy. Well, if the Earth is established that it cannot be moved, but the sun goes around the Milky Way, then the sun would fly off away from the Earth and we'd never see the sun again. So when the Bible talks of the sun having a circuit, it's talking about the sun circuiting around a flat earth. Number eight, circle of the earth. So those who loosely read the Bible point to Isaiah 40 verse 22, which says, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And they use that verse to support a round earth. But there is a difference between a sphere and a circle. Isaiah knew the difference between a ball and a circle because he describes a ball in Isaiah 22 verse 18. So why did Isaiah not use the same word for ball when describing the earth in chapter 40? That's because the earth is not a ball, it's a flat disc shape with a dome on top and pillars underneath. Number 7. Grasshoppers Psalm 33, verse 14, from the place of his uh, habitation, he looks upon the inhabitants of the earth. You can't do that on a 13.8 billion light year across the universe. It's a dome. Isaiah 40, verse 22, it is he that sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. If you're outside the expanding heliocentric universe, then we wouldn't resemble grasshoppers. The entire galaxy would resemble a speck. It's a dome over a flat earth. Number six, deception. Matthew 24, verse 24. If it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. Ephesians 5, verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. So, if you are deceived about the ball-shaped earth, thinking a sphere is the truth then you've got no chance of ever being able to understand the Bible, yourself barred from all knowledge. If you take the view that the flat earth is a distraction, then what exactly is it distracting you from? What, celebrity gossip? Uh, or if you believe it doesn't matter if the earth is round or flat, then you're a self-confessed idiot, because it absolutely does matter if the earth is flat or round. You'll never be able to understand the Bible at all if you think the Flat, round earth is a distraction or doesn't matter. Number five, tent. If we go back to Isaiah 40 verse 22 and expand on it, it sa if you remember, it says, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. Here's a picture of my tent. I went camping in it a month ago. How exactly are you confusing a tent, a dome-like structure, for an expanding universe 13.8 billion light-years across? They don't match up. Again, this verse gives credence to the fact that it's a flat earth with a dome-like structure above. Number four, ends of the earth. Job 37, verse 3, and his lightning unto the ends of the earth. Daniel 4, verse 11, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. Proverbs 30 verse 4, who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if you can tell?
<laughs> wow. Wow. Proverbs is Old Testament, and what a prophecy that is. Not only is it predicting Jesus, the Son of God, but also the ends of a flat, level earth. There's no end on a ball-shaped earth. It goes around continuously. You can only come to an end on a flat, level plane. Number three, lies. Jeremiah 16, verse 19. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth, and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. This is a future prophecy following a monstrous destruction of people who believed lies. But it could just as easily apply now, today. Here we are today showing evidence of the ends of the earth, telling people the earth is flat, and the generation who lived from the 1930s until now got lied to. The generation above us inherited lies, and those who stand for nothing will believe anything. There's no end to the earth on a ball. That's because it's not a ball, it's flat. Number two, the four winds. The Bible is consistent all the way through from Old to New Testament that there's four winds. For example, Jeremiah 49 verse 36, four winds. Daniel 7 verse 2, four winds. Matthew 24 verse 31, four winds. Revelation 7 verse 1, four winds. If you've got understanding, you'll know there's a jet stream that connects North America with Europe. Commercial aircraft try to fly in the jet stream to conserve fuel. Do some diligent research and you'll find there's um, four jet streams, two in the north and two in the southern hemisphere. So how did the guys who penned the Bible know about these four jet streams when they were only discovered in the 1920s when planes could finally fly high enough to discover them? So we have a dome-shaped earth that requires uh, cross-ventilation. Okay, so here's an example of cross ventilation. Here's my here's my boiler in there, and you've got to have two ventilations, uh, one at the top and one at the bottom. It's not sufficient to just have one because that wouldn't circulate the air through. You've got to have uh, two for sufficient ventilation. If you want to properly ventilate your roof to prevent dry rot or wet rot, you'll need a minimum of two vents, one here and one here. But if you want to ventilate the entire earth, then you'll need inlets of air and outlets. That's why in Revelation 7 verse 1 it says, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And the picture you see on screen is a graphical representation of the four angels on the four corners of the earth. Each of them would feed in a jet stream of air into the dome, a bit like a leaf blower to cross-ventilate the entire earth. Jet streams wouldn't work on a ball-shaped earth because they'd fizzle out to nothing very quickly. The only way I can visualise a jet stream working is to feed that jet stream somehow into the system by an inlet it's impossible to replicate a, a constant, fast-flowing column of air on a ball Earth without something feeding that air into the system. Scientists will try and make out the case that hot and cold air colliding will cause a jet stream, but I think that's unlikely. So that brings us to the number one reason, and that is mathematics. Uh, in Psalm 147 verse 5, it's referring uh, to the Almighty, it says, His understanding is infinite. And if we get to Genesis 1 verse 1, In the beginning God created the heaven, singular, and the earth. What you're about to see is approximately 20 seconds of complicated stuff. Just follow along as best you can here for 20 seconds, because... This will knock your socks off. In Hebrew, the first sentence of the Bible looks like this. If you take the number of Hebrew letters and times that by the product of the letters and then divide that by the number of words times the product of the words, you get 3.1416. That's the value of pi to four decimal places. 
pi is the relationship of a circle's circumference to its diameter, so you measure the circumference of any circle all the way round and divide that by the diameter straight across, and you get 3.14, the value of pi, an infinite string of numbers. OK, that's the complicated stuff over. What the Bible is describing here is clearly a circle and not a sphere. And only a flat geostationary circular Earth fits that description. And if that failed to knock your socks off, then you've not been paying attention. Because what we've got here is the Bible describing the creation of the Earth in words, and behind those words we've got a mathematical formula that not only verifies the authenticity of the text, a fingerprint of God, if you will, but it describes the very shape of the Earth, circular. In the future, I might post a video just on this subject alone, or I might write a book on the subject, or I might correspond with and collaborate with people who care. Uh, there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. And finally, Luke 18, verse 17, For nothing is hid, that shall not be made manifest, nor anything secret that shall not be known and come to light. Thank you for making it to the end of this video. If you'd like to see more information and research into the Flat Earth, then you can click the left. If you've had enough and you can't take it anymore, then there's a funny video on the right. A full transcript of this video is, well, might be in the comments if it will fit. Uh, you can also find more information in the description box below uh, by clicking more. God bless you all, and remember, the answer to 1984 is 33 AD. Approximately. <laughs>